Saturday night at DEF CON? It wasn't really at Saturday night at DEF CON, right? Okay, so anyway, we'll start now. My name's Jay Beal. I'm here to uh, talk about Bastio Linux, and um, we've done a lot more with the tool now, and I want to show you what we've done. It's been a little while since we talked about Bastio at DEF CON, and, um, and we've got some more to show. What's that, louder? Yeah. How's that? Pick up any better? No. Okay. Try and type while I do this. Move closer. Like this? I will eat the microphone. I stole that from Raven. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk about Bastille Linux. My name is Jay Beal, and we've done lots of new stuff, or some major, one major, one major new thing and a lot of little things. And I'll show you what we're doing. Um, by the way, if you've got the slides that are on the CD, these are slightly updated. They're only minor updates. Um, the stuff on the CD is pretty comprehensive. These just look a little bit nicer. So you can grab them from here. I'll let you write down the URL. I will let you stop writing down the URL. Okay, so let me. I'm going to talk to. You, I'm going to tell you about what Bastille did before, what it does now. We'll, t we'll take a pretty in-depth look, and I'll even tell you a little bit about how you can extend it yourself. Because, well, uh, it's open source, and we could always use the help. And um, and heck, if you want to do it yourself back home and not share, well, we'll, we'll be okay with that too. Um, so Bastille Linux is a hardening program for for Linux. That's a whole bunch of distributions. That's Red Hat and Mandrake and SUSE and Debian and Ubuntu and Gen 2 and Turbo Linux and there's probably one or two others, but I'm not sure. Not yet Slack. I'm so sorry. I know, I keep promising Slack one day. Okay, well, Slack once I get a Slack VM, right? Um, but it also works in HPUX because Hewlett Packard put in some programmers and they've been helping a whole lot. And it works in OS X, except not 10.4 because Cisco's VPN client didn't work on 10.4, my first install, so I had to blow that away. You. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it works on plenty of it works on plenty of Linux, uh, uh, plenty of Unixes, and we're expanding that list. Um, the biggest thing that differentiated Bastille from other hardening scripts before was that it was that well first that we shared it right, and that you know instead of us all using our, our one offs, but also that it educated the administrator about the process. It educated the administrator about hardening and about what they could harden. It tried to get people to stop using Telnet, for example. Tried to stop getting people. Tried to stop getting uh, to get people to stop using clear text protocols. Who's seen the wall of sheep? I can't believe that wall is still scrolling. I just. I mean, how could you walk by there, see your picture there, and not start telling everybody? Oh my God! You know, clear text bad. Okay. Um, anyway, the new news is that Bastille now does now has a, a kind of audit or assessment function, and what it's doing is it can actually tell you how well hardened the box is so far. Okay, it can say. These are, all, these are all the hardening steps I know about. These are the ones that you've done. These are the ones you haven't done. And the idea of well hardened, it can, it, it, it can also compute a score. And so you can say, this is how well hardened this box is. And well hardened is something that you can define personally. You can kind of take the Bastille team's advice. Or you, can get a, or you can get a definitions file that talks about how well hardened the box should be from your organization, whatever that organization is, employer or auditing board or whatever. So. Let me just show you how the show you how the two of them interact, and um, and hopefully I'll be able to keep this mic close enough to my throat. You guys can still hear me, um, but let me just demo and show you how it works, so I don't keep just talking about it. Attempting to keep mic. Can you guys hear me in the back still? Oh man. <laughs> Choked on a microphone. What's that? How's that? Better? Tip it up. Slightly in front of me. Stand on one foot. Start typing. Okay, I can do that. That's easy. So, let's see. I'm SSH'd right now into a Fedora Core into a Fedora Core Four system. So what I'm going to do is Bastille. Can you guys see the bottom of the screen? Oh yeah, these are great screens. Okay, so I'm typing Bastille minus A for audit, and it's gone and it's just finished the audit. 
kind of a fast process. And this is what our initial audit report looks like. What you've got here is a score out of 10, and I'll tell you more about that score over time. And this thing right here says how we got that score, what weights file we used. I'll talk about weights files some more, but basically, who decided how your system should be scored is in that. Okay, so there are, there are items here that don't have a weight. There are items here, here, let's see. So I'll show you basically the way this works. Bastille's a whole bunch of modules, and you're gonna see these modules. I just want you to see the structure of the report. Okay, Bastille's a whole bunch of modules. So one of them is called file permissions, or we'll page down a little bit. Okay, one of them's, one of them's a send mail module here. So here's the DNS module here, just at the top of the screen. And this basically is an item called cheroot bind, and that labels something you can redefine if you like. It can be item 4.3 if you like. Um, here's a question, is, is bind in a root jail, is it set to run non-root? Here's your current state, yes it is. Here's the weight of that question, ah, oh, sorry, you didn't really get anything for it, it was weighted zero, that wasn't something that you were required to do or it wasn't something that you were considering as all that important. And then here's the score contribution based on that weight. Does that make sense? So the idea is, oh, and if we go to that question, a little pop-up if you've got JavaScript on in this browser. This is all running locally, so we want to talk about JavaScript issues and all that. Let's just trust me for now. This is running locally. You're not, the, the idea is that the browser isn't off doing other things. This browser's popped up by Bastille. You can have another browser hanging around. This is your separate one. Um, so we've got a pop-up. If you don't like pop-ups, you can turn off JavaScript in it, and you can just click on the question, and the question will give you, can you guys see that? No, okay. How's that? Okay, so, the, so, so this question is named in a true jail. This is, the, this is the thing that's being checked, and it's also an item that can be hardened in Bastille, and this explanation here basically says, this is why you should do this. And I'll show you that some more, but one of the Bastille's things is it says, listen, here's why you should true name D. Because you could be a total newbie. You could be like, what does true mean? What's name D? Right, and so we'll try to give you a feel for it. We'll say, okay, this is what you should know, this is why you should do this, maybe this is when you shouldn't. This is when, because everyone's always concerned with hardening. What if that's gonna break something? Oh, it's gonna break something, right? So the idea is, okay, I understand that risk. Let us tell you when it would break something, when it wouldn't break something, and let you make an informed decision. Does that make sense? So, um, so here's my report thing. And it goes on for pages. You can print it out if you like. But there's also something where you can just contract all the modules. We're working on a, on a cooler looking version of this. And I'll tell you a little, little bit about that as we go on. But you can contract all the modules and say just see one of them. So it's a fun little interface. It's a simple little interface, but it does the job. Um, there are, of course, people who are really into, who are really saying, listen, why can't I run this in text mode? I'm not really a, an X person. Um, if Bastille finds that you haven't, that you're not actually doing X forwarding, it'll pop up its own text browser. It'll pop up links or W3M or links to or the other links, you know, or whatever it is. And then there's two other things here. There's also a text version of that. So you can see it like that. And then the other piece, which I'm going to refer to later, is that there's something that's machine parsable. And by machine parsable, the weird thing is, this thing looks a whole lot like a Bastille config file. This will come up later. This thing looks, we can give you a version that says, for each, for each module, for each item number in there, what your current state is, whether you're hardened, whether you're not hardened, the Y and Ns or whatever, are basically the answers that it found on the system. Does that make sense? So I'll show you, let's take this, let's take this and run Bastille normally. I'm running Bastille minus X to show it an X. Oh, there's something everybody should know. We all, remember when we all used to tell that into systems and you type X clock, you type Netscape and you see things pop up graphically and that was good. And then we did that with SSH and that was good. And then it stopped working, like all of a sudden you SSH into something and there was no X anymore. Everybody, anybody have that? Raise your hand if you had that happen. Okay, maybe only a few people have had, maybe only a few people have had that happen. Just SSH minus capital X and it, it's like it used to be. It's a security thing almost, sort of, kind of. Anyway, so I've started up Bastille and I don't know, can you guys read this? I can't see from over here. Okay, well, anyway, why don't I just, I'm gonna, <laughs> fine. What this basically is, is it's a bunch of, what this basically is, is it's just a bunch of, there's a bunch of modules on the left side, 
And I'll show you a screenshot later on that'll be a little bit easier to see. But there's a bunch of modules on the left side. There's a question up here that says, would you like to do this thing? There's an explanation here that says, here's why you would want to and here's why you wouldn't want to. It's the same one you saw on the auditing side. And then there's like a yes or no. So we can kind of go through and just tell it we want to harden the system. And I'm basically just choosing the defaults for now. The defaults for Bastille are basically chosen so that you won't get, so that you won't screw things up too badly if you just go through and never to make a decision if you always click yes or click no. You're losing a lot of the benefit if you do that the first time because we've probably got something to tell you about. Okay. Bastille's got a firewall that I'm skipping for anybody watching and another tool that I'm skipping that I'll talk about later. So Bastille will go and it'll basically just go and say, this is, these are the things I did. And there's an error in here because it's trying to work on inetd.conf and there isn't one on the system and there's no x inetd either. Um, but that's not something to really worry about. So what I've got right now is if I were to look at, if I were to look at the number of things that are still running, okay. Wow, that should be off. Okay, well, what I can do right now, let me just rerun in audit mode and show you. I just went through and hardened the system. And I hardened the system with pretty significant speed because I wasn't trying to so much demo the tool. What we just did was we went from a score of five point something to a score of eight point something, almost nine. And if I'd chosen the non, if I'd chosen something stricter than the defaults all along, we'd actually have a higher score. And we can see and we can look at basically each question and say, okay, what got turned off and what got turned on. Does that make sense? Is that, it's kind of, the idea is, there are tools that have been auditing, there, have been, there are tools that have been auditing before, and there are tools that have been hardening before, and now we're kind of doing both. And that's got a certain advantage. And one of the advantages is that you can motivate people to harden more, because they're like, wow, hey, look, I can see my score. Or you can, well, I've got slides, I'll show you. But the idea is that it's, it's a pretty useful thing to be able to even have tools line up. Um, well, let me show you, let me show you slides. Okay, here, now I can probably be heard a whole lot better. Um, so, in essence, the first, the first question is kind of why do you do assessment at all, right? We just, I just showed you, hey, we build an audit tool, and you're like, wow, gee, I'm not an auditor. Why do I care, right? I, I, maybe you're not thinking that. Maybe you're thinking this is really cool, and that's what I hope you're thinking. But if you're not, maybe I can tell you why it's useful. Can you hear me, or am I still not eating the mic sufficiently well? Okay. I will keep trying to eat the microphone. Okay, so in terms of why you do assessment in the first place, the first reason you do assessment is because it teaches, the, it teaches the system about things they could harden. It teaches them about hardening settings they could apply they might not have known about before. I mean, one of the weird things in the Unix world is we kind of all feel like we know everything, and it's hard to find out you don't, that there's something you don't know if you feel like you know everything. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of a, you know, and so the idea of this is to show you what you might not know, or at least what hasn't been done to the system yet. Bastille's always had this education thing as a second purpose. This is, a, this is a normal screenshot. This is what I was going through, but a little more blown up. Um, before, if we look at this, what we're doing is this goes and says, hey, do you want to turn on stack protection in the kernel? Here's the reason you want to do this. It turns out you can break tons of buffer overflow exploits. You can bre break lots of buffer overflows, one of the major kinds of exploits out there, if you just turn on the stack protection. Here's when you don't want to. GDB is a mode that it doesn't work with if you turn on stack protection. What else? Well, not much else. Okay, so we can tell you, we can tell you, here's what we'd like to do and find out if you want to do it. Why else do you do assessment? Triage, right? You basically take each of your systems, you're like, you're like, I'd like to harden my systems, I don't know where to start. I can start with my workstation, yeah, that's good. Right, but I don't know where to start, I can go with the most vital servers. How about which one's worse? How about pick the one that's least hardened? How pick the one that's in least, in worse need? So you can basically go and take Bastille, and generate that score or look at that config file and look at what things, what things matter. If you know what things matter, you could set weights according to these are the things that matter and then score your systems, right? The score thing lets you start, the score thing, the user configurable score thing, lets you start saying, okay, these systems are worse, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of them first. Or these systems are worse, I'm gonna maybe do a little bit of incident response because they're so bad, right? Does that make sense? Or maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with, you know, running my, running my NMAP scans, running my Nessus scans. I'll look for vulnerabilities in the system. I'll look for back doors on the system is really what I care about here. Okay, what else? Another reason to do assessment is that auditing, is that auditing happens. You will be audited. We all get audited at some point. Maybe you don't, but a lot of us do. A lot of my clients do, right? So the idea is 
okay, you know you're, you know you're going to get audited. It'd be nice to find out what's going what's to show up, what's going to happen, and be able to work on it proactively. And so this, the idea here is to give you a tool that's equivalent to your auditor's tools. And you can use a weights file again that, that's basically defined the same way your auditor's is. And that's our hope. If, anybody, if anybody's with any of the major auditing organizations, I've worked with CIS. If you're with ISACA, if you're with one of the other organizations and you want to contribute something, I would love it if you would help contribute work on weights files. Just help, help us tell, okay, what are auditors looking for? But I mean, we've got a framework now where we can do that. What else? Bastille could be helpful here with compliance, okay? Um, if, you've got, if you've just gotten hit over the head in the last year with new legislation that says, okay, we've got to care about security now, um, or, you know, we're going to get measured on it, we already ca always cared about it, well, maybe Bastille will help you in figuring out how well, how well you are compliance. You're in compliance. The weird thing is that some of these compliances are actually really kind of fuzzy. They say that you've got to do due diligence, that you've got to do a pretty good job, right? Well, what's that mean? Well, if we've got an idea, if we've got an idea how systems scored, and we can show, okay, well, we went from here to here, or we can say, listen, most of our industry does this. They score at this on this weights file. Well, then you start being able to say that you're basically keeping up with your peers, which is what due diligence means. It doesn't mean that you did everything, everything possible. It just basically means you did what most everybody else who's doing a good job is doing. That's kind of fuzzy, but we'll try to help you with that anyway. What else? You could go and say, this is another thing that comes up in universities, network protection. It's saying, listen, I'd like to make sure that before a system's put on my network, before a Unix system is put on my network, I want to make sure that it's well patched and I want to make sure that it's well hardened. And if it's well hardened to basically these standards, then I'll let it on the, then I'll let it on the network. And if it's not, well, I'm sorry, you know, just come back in a day when you're done. Or actually, since hardening is pretty fast, as you guys saw, you know, come back in five minutes. Um, does that make sense? This is this kind of interesting? You guys, eh, useful? Okay, cool. Um, the other thing is scoring has this awesome psychological power. Okay, I worked on, a, I worked on another tool like this. And I remember when we were developing it, it was the CIS Unix scoring tool. And when we were developing it, they said, we're going to give you a score. You, you know, you want to compute a score. And I'm like, a score? One number? I mean, I studied mathematics, OK? You know, like, I did physics, too. We don't have one number. I was like, oh, god. At worst, like, make it a 10-element vector and then, like, you know, con you know, compute some kind of a mean of that or whatever. You know, compute a metric based on, like, weights of that. And someone's like, no, 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 one number. And I'm like, one number. OK, fine. Management folks will like one number. That was my first thought. It turns out geeks like one number too. One number is really kind of useful, okay? The score thing is really nice because people are naturally competitive. And geeks are naturally competitive. And hackers are really naturally competitive, right? So, so the idea is that first, people get around to hardening sooner. People are like, you know, I'm, I'm meaning to harden that system. I'll get around to it later on. All of a sudden, when they're like confronted with, you know, a score that says mediocre, they're like, wait, I'm not mediocre. I kick ass. You know? That's not the way this should be. I should never score a four. I'm not getting around to that later. I'm doing it right freaking now. Okay? So I'll, I'll give you an example. We had a, we had a security instructor. He was a SANS instructor. He, you know, he was an instructor teaching lots of people things. He thought a lot of himself, of course, as we all do. Right? And he said, okay, um, I'll, you know, I'll beta test your software. So he was beta testing. And he ran this thing on his workstation. And his workstation came up at about a six out of ten. And he got peeved. He's like, what are you saying? This is the mediocre issue. He said, I'm not a 6 out of 10. Screw that. And he sat down. He didn't even talk to us. He just sat down and started hardening a system. And 10 minutes later, he ran the tool again, and they gave him an 8. And he's like, ah, that's more like it. I'm not a 6. A 6 is like, you know, 60%. That's like a D. No, no, I'm, I'm much better than that. It's nice. Play against people's ego. He didn't see himself as a 6 out of 10 kind of guy. Fine by me. Whatever gets him to take proactive security measures is good. OK. Um, this has happened lots of times. When we were developing this, this previous scoring tool, we talked to a bank. And the bank had set up a scoring tool they'd, they'd created. Their security folks had, like, you know, like many security folks and organizations, had no power whatsoever. We couldn't, you know, it wasn't like, hand of God, you know, you will harden. It's not like that. They were like, uh, we'd like to help. How can we help? And that's what, a lot of, that's what a lot of security folks and organizations are like. So they went to their sysadmins. They said, here's this tool. Why don't you try and run it once? Okay, and so they ran it once. They didn't have any mandated high score. They didn't have any mandated anything. The only thing was, can you try this tool once? Let us know how it goes. And so they did start using it. And different groups had different groups of sysadmins had different reactions. They're basically all positive, but there were some sysadmins who started voluntarily posting their scores up on a cork board, like outside their cube. Okay, I know that sounds really, really nerdy, but you know, okay, we're all really nerds here, right? We're just pretending to be cool. Okay, maybe you all are cool. I'm just not. Um, <laughs> 
Right, but the, the idea is like, okay, it'd be really great if we got people competing, and they, and they do, okay? The start, the start Linux system scores around a five. This doesn't work on Solaris yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if like a Solaris 8 system scored around a three, right? Solaris has got freaking everything on by default. Um, we will get around to porting Bastille to Solaris. It's just a whole lot of work. Um, anybody wants to help? We've got two people who are working on it already and would love the help. Um, but there's, but the nice that, so that's, that's why you do, that's why you do assessment. It's why you do audit. These are the, these are the useful things about pushing an auditing tool in your organization or pushing whatever. So, so why do you, why do you like the two together? Why did I, why did I, you know, why did we add auditing to Bastille instead of just creating a new auditing tool, right? That'd be kind of cool. Well, the idea is that when you're hardening a system, when you're hardening a system, it creates a policy file. When you go through this interactive yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, you get a policy file whether you like it or not. It just gets saved. It gets saved in this given place, and you can take that policy file and you can do something with it. Well, one of the things you can do with it is you can feed it back in. You can feed it back in and see how well you're doing against that policy file. You could say, okay, it's been three months. I've been patching. I have just, you know, ordinary system rot. I'd like to know how far off I am. The other thing in terms of that policy file is if you cr we, since we created a policy file by default every time you harden, you harden, we create a policy file. You can take that policy file and say, this is my policy file for all my web servers. And now you don't have to run through the whole best deal thing again, right? It just, it's got a back end where you just feed it the policy file, it sucks it in, hardens the system, and you know, two minutes later, you're ready, right? You can take that policy file and reuse it. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of reuse. I was just talking about skew detection. If you take that policy file and you've said, this is my web server template, Suppose you've got a web server that's older. You, maybe you can't harden it. Maybe the boss has said, listen, we don't want anyone making any substantial changes to the system. You can make changes one at a time by hand. Fine. You say, all our other web servers are here. I've got a policy file that says how they were hardened. Let's see how this one stacks up. So I take this one, and I, stack, and, and I run the auditing tool on it, and it says, OK, these are the four things that you normally do to all your other web servers that you haven't done to this one because it's older. Is that cool? Does that make sense? So it's called skew detection, and it's a, it's a decent thing. There are some politics to this. There's a reason. I keep talking about psychological powers. Psycho psychology is a really weird thing to be talking about with regard to hardening. Not necessarily with regard to DEF CON, right? You're all psyching each other out all the time. There's psychological games. Eh. This is the weird thing. Psychological games in the workplace, right? We're all used to it if we're in the workplace. Politics. There are, lots of, there are lots of times where you can't harden a system by hand or with a tool because someone says, oh no, I think that might break things. Or you can't touch that, that's my system. No changes, right? The nice thing about this is that you can say, we've taken, we've got all of our web servers. We've got four web servers that I built. We've got the one that, you know, that Mad Max is still maintaining. And Mad Max says anyone who touches his system gets his fingers chopped off, okay? Well, you know, listen, Mad Max's boss, my boss, can you just ask Mad Max if he'd run this tool for you once? Like, just run it, just auditing, read only, won't modify a system in any way. And if you survive the encounter of requesting that he run it, what do we find out? Well, we find out Mad Max's system scores for, far worse than the rest of the systems that do the exact same thing. Oh, great, now we've got another way to get, we've got another way to get the worst systems hardened. Why do I care about hardening so much? Right? I care about hardening so much because while it's kind of, you know, one of the least exciting areas of computer security, right next to, like, policy and logging, um, you know, it's still, it's extremely effective. You don't get boxes rooted. It, it's really nice to not get boxes rooted. It's not a lot of work either if you're using a tool for it. So anyway, you can read, you can run Bastille and, and basically other auditing tools, read only, and the idea is, okay, we'll learn something about the system without having to modify it. Um, this really helps when you have a shop that does manual hardening. People say, okay, we only modify things by hand. We don't trust any tool whatsoever. We don't trust any tool that doesn't come with a million dollar warranty from the vendor and, a, and an oiler that says, you know, we'll of course take care of any losses you incur from bugs in our product, right? If you can only do manual hardening, fine. We'll tell you what to do. Read only means you don't have to stop doing manual hardening. It just means we'll help you out and tell you what you should do. Toward that end, we're working to create Bastilix. I don't know, we're going to have to call it something else. But basically, Nopix plus Bastille. So you've got a system. <coughs> you've got a system, and we will, you've got a system, we'll, we'll basically just let you. You shut it down, you bring it back up, booting Bastilix, or whatever we call it, okay? And it starts up, it says, okay, it's, it, I'm not going to mount the drives read-write, mount them read-only, run Bastille, here's your score. Here's your score report. No changes ever made to the system. You can do this. You can do this to Mad Max's system while he's on his lunch break or taking a sick day, right? 
as long as you have someone's permission or something. Okay. So I've been talking about I've been talking about trying to convince people to harden. I've been talking about the psychology. I've been talking about how it is you do it. You can use this tool to do it. You can use this tool to find out how well you've hardened. But the big question always comes up: Why the heck do I harden in the first place? Okay. Basically, if you don't, if I haven't made it very clear what hardening is already, I'm about to. Hardening is just the process of trying to make a system harder to break into. And the idea is that you take any settings you can tweak and you tweak them. You turn things off and you configure stuff that you left on better. Okay, so the biggest, the first objection we always get to hardening, hopefully not at DEF CON, is that people say, my box isn't interesting enough. We're just a little K through 12 school. You know, why are we gonna, why is anyone gonna attack us? We're just a paint thinner company. You know, why is anyone actually gonna attack our computers? They're, they're not interesting. You're not gonna get any money out of attacking our computers. Worst case, you might have some extra paint thinner shipped to you. You know, what hacker wants that? Can you do anything with paint thinner that I don't know about? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so but everyone says I'm not interesting enough. I won't be targeted. Does anybody at DEF CON still think this? Okay, don't raise your hand. But if you think this and you've put your laptop on the wireless network, well, try running an IDS for a few minutes or a, or a packet capture pa packet capture program. You see some very interesting attacks coming your way. I, I wonder how many port scans everyone on the DEF CON network sees per I don't know minute. Um, anyway. Low value targets aren't, okay? Most targets aren't low value. This is something we should all understand. Your box is useful as the next hop on the way to the target, just to make it a little bit tougher to track the attacker back. Your box is good as a peer to peer host. Your box is good as a where is distribution site. Heck, you could be low bandwidth. Your box would be useful as, a, as an IRC bot, right? I mean, there's, your box will be useful to someone. The thing is that your box isn't usually targeted in any way, right? Most of our attacks don't come from, don't come from, tar from being targeted. And when they do, half the time, we, probably at least half the time, we don't know that we've even been compromised because people are that good, right? But most of the attacks that, that we see are these are, are the script kiddies coming after us. Most of the attacks that we see aren't targets of choice; they're targets of opportunity. Okay, there's some. Your attacker had an exploit against, say, you know, one particular version of PHP. So they go and they scan a large swaths of the internet. They go and scan the entire Comcast at home network, and they find your box along with a hundred others. And they take those hundred systems, and they uh, they take those hundred systems, and they pwn them, and write, you know, these boxes now belong to them. But it's not because you were targeted; it's because you had an IP on Comcast that day, and that was the guy attacking that day, right? That was the that was the network this guy was scanning. Does that make sense? Okay, I think that's kind of obvious at DEF CON. Okay, so we do tons of patching. Right, we do tons of patching. We're constantly patching. I mean, we're all, I spent all of yesterday patching and all the day before that and every single day patching. We all patch and patch and patch and patch, right? Well, okay, not really, but we do lots of patching. The problem is that if you patch, you still get compromised. You're like, wait, I, I patch every single day. Why do they get compromised if I patch every single day at midnight? Well, you still get patched because you've still got these windows of vulnerability. A window of vulnerability is basically the time during which somebody's got a working exploit and the time and, and when your systems and when and your systems are still vulnerable. So the time where someone has a working exploit and your system is vulnerable, that's your window of vulnerability. It's broken apart into three parts, two of which you have no control over. The first one is, can you guys still hear me or am I not micing well enough? Sorry. The first one is, the first part of your window of vulnerability is where the exploit exists, but the vendor doesn't even know about the issue. Call this ODA, right? You can do nothing about that. If, the, if, if, nobody knows about the, if nobody knows about the vulnerability except the people with the exploit and they're hitting you, well, you're vulnerable whether you like it or not. We can do something about that. Hardening actually works on this. The next piece is an exploit exists and the vendor isn't creating a patch and they're not done creating a patch. It takes them a little while. Say it takes them, you know, a week, but really nowadays it's about a month. Okay? And then the third is a patch exists and you haven't applied it yet. Most of us patch kind of closer to monthly or, you know, weekly maybe. It would be nice if weekly. Right, but some people only patch quarterly, and God, some people patch yearly, and some people never patch at all. But the issue is that because you've got these first two parts of that window, even if you patch perfectly, you still end up with a vulnerable machine now and then. You still end up with a vulnerable machine, and you're just kind of like rolling the dice, hoping that today your machine isn't vulnerable and attacked at the same time. Does that make sense? So the idea is we like hardening because this is reactive. Reactive is going and patching. Reactive is going and saying, oh God, we just got attacked on this port, or people are attacking on this port, maybe I should set my firewall to start blocking, to start blocking SQL server queries, right? That's kind of the reactive process. 
The proactive process is configuring that firewall ahead of time and saying, wait, there's no reason for anyone to do SQL queries from outside my network into my network. Or better yet, I don't use, these are the protocols I allow in, and I don't allow the rest in, so if SQL ends up being the, being an, ends up being the worm tomorrow, not so much the worries, okay? The other thing we do is we harden a host, because if we harden a host, maybe it won't be vulnerable. Okay, hardening is just the process of configuring a system for better security. It means you turn off things you're not using. It means you're better configuring the stuff you are using. It doesn't involve the kernel level modification of the system, like SD Linux or Pitbull or Trusted BSD, Solaris or whatever, what have you. Um, it does involve going and looking at permissions, access controls, and looking at whether the permissions are appropriate or too lax. You remember a couple releases ago, Apple, my trusty Apple, right, had a wonderful vulnerability to let any user on the system backdoor a bunch of third-party applications because the permissions were world writable. Anybody remember that? That was a really good one. Dave G found that. It was awesome. Um, it was awesome in multi-user systems. I'm sure some people at universities had a really great time with the Apple X serves. Um, what else? Um, it just, the other side of it is it involves basically tweaking, tweaking settings in the system and in the applications to give users what access they need and not really any more of it. Okay, it comes down to two principles. One's least privilege, the other's minimalism. Least privilege says basically each application or OS component or user or whatever only grants whatever privilege the other users need, that the users need to get it, right? The users only get what privilege we, we want to give them. Minimalism says we configure the system for fewer features. We say these are the features we're using. Let's better tune the system. You'll get some nice speed out of this, right? Because you won't be running 50 applications, you'll be running five. Just the five that we're supposed to be running here. In essence, okay, this is, now there's, there's one thing people ask, well, what about SE Linux? What about the kernel level stuff? Kernel level, stuff's, the kernel level stuff is basically complementary to hardening. You can, you can basically do both. Fedora, my Fedora Core 4 system has SE Linux turned on, and I'm hardening it with Bastille. Okay. Um, the thing with kernel level is that sometimes is that kernel level can be really awesome because it can contain a lot you can't do with hardening. On the other hand, hardening can do some things that kernel level can't do. One is that, one is that kernel level very often contains the attacker after they've taken down the, after they've compromised bind, you know, they, they compromise bind, bind falls down, they don't get their powerful root shell because they're SE Linux. On the other hand, if we can configure the thing that the, the thing that was being attacked so the exploit doesn't work, or the code the exploit was trying to hit isn't available at all, maybe it's turned off, maybe it's removed, well, then we don't get compromised at all. The bind server never goes down. The best example I can give you is Apache. Most of Apache's real functionality comes in these Apache modules that you can turn off at start time. It's not a recompile, it's just like comment something out, it doesn't load. You have code that doesn't load because you configured it not to. Apache's a great example too because it comes with, like Red Hat ships it with say, 34 different Apache modules, of which you might need five, depending on what kind of site you're running. So if you can turn off the ones you're not using, and a vulnerability comes out in one of the ones that, the, one of the ones that was on before, congratulations, you don't get nailed by it. Is that cool? Does that make sense? So, um, the other side of kernel level hardening is that it's hard. Um, kernel level, I mean kernel level, kernel level technologies are hard. Writing the profiles, saying this program needs to write to this, needs to read to this, it needs to be able to do this capability but not this capability, that takes, that takes a lot of, that takes understanding. It takes a whole bunch of training to learn how to do that. Red Hat's made that possible with SE Linux because they've said, okay, we'll write a really good profile for the users and not require them to do it. On the other hand, the profiles are a little looser than you'd want them to be because Reddit has to make sure that whatever you're going to do with that web server, it still works. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, you can learn to make your own profiles. It just takes some real training. I mean, they're, they're like, there's a book on SE Linux. Okay. Um, anyway, you should continue looking at kernel level solutions. They're nice. I really like GR security. I like SE Linux. These are good. They're just, I consider them, they're, they're complementary. You can still harden and probably still should. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's a little bit, it, it can be a little tedious if you're doing it all by hand, but well, we, we've got a tool for that, um, right? But it's not hard to do. CIS, the Center for Internet Security, writes guides, and the guides are, de the guides are designed to be used by junior level, junior level sysadmins, okay? People who, you know, you, you might not even know entirely how to work their, their favorite editor just yet, okay? And it's still, this, this stuff can still be done. Black Hat has a two-day course, I teach it, Right? And that two-day course is, does Solaris and Linux, and it's comprehensive. There are five-day courses at other organizations, but, but the fact that you can learn it that quickly says something. I mean, I could teach you one operating system, how to manually harden in a day. Okay, we do two in two days. This is not hard stuff. This isn't rocket science. This isn't anywhere near rocket science. 
Um, there's, you know, anyway, it's pretty easy to do. It's also really effective. And I'll tell you about two examples. The first is the CIS guide, NSA's, NSA's IAD, the information assurance guys that, that are around to stop machines from being broken into, put, basically took a benchmark and ran it against a Windows system. And when they were done, 90% of the vulnerabilities that were in that Windows system were mitigated. You couldn't hit them, okay? They either, you either couldn't use them or you couldn't get anywhere by using them. You can do the same thing with Linux if you will use one of the, if you basically do all the hardening guides. You don't have an extremely useful system, but 90 to 95 percent of your vulnerabilities are gone. So, um, Bastio Linux is just a way to do this programmatically. When we created it, we created it before Red Hat, before, right when Red Hat 6.0 came out. We just did a normal audit of a Red Hat 6.0 system, very very standard. Just looked at it, said, what would you do if you're doing best practice hardening? Okay, we wrote a program to do it. It basically stopped or contained every major vulnerability that was in the system, which was really nice. Bind it had a remote root hole. WooFTPD it had a remote root hole. LPD plus Sendmail, the combination of those two, got you another remote root. Dump restore, local privilege escalation. GPM was a console level, uh, console level privilege escalation. All of those things were stopped by Bastille. That's not because Bastille is just amazingly wonderful, right? I'd like to think it is, but that's because if you do this standard normal stuff, that we've got in books, that we've got on documentation, we've got on websites or whatever, this is what happens. There were only two we didn't nail, and they were just little commands that if root ran them, and somebody had created, and somebody had been able to like say, create a hostile man page, well that's not anything we could really do anything about. That's one of those things that hardening won't get you. But that's okay. So Bastille can kind of lock down, this is our complete list of what Bastille locks down right now. It does Red Hat, all the old ones, and Enterprise, and Fedora Core, and I'll release Fedora Core 4 tomorrow. Um, supports only in CVS for that. HPUX, Mandrake, or Mandriever, whatever you call it, Debian, SUSE, Gen2, Mac OS X, Solaris, soon. Um, need help. Um, again, one of the differences that with Bastille is it educated the sysadmin. Educating the sysadmin is really good if you say want the sysadmin to not end up on the, uh, on the uh, wall of sheep, right? If you want the sysadmin to stop using Telnet, you have to tell them Telnet's bad. Because otherwise they'll say, I've been using Telnet for 10 years. What's wrong with Telnet? And you say, well, I can take it over. I can sniff it. I can sniff it or take it over when you got switches. Don't use it. Use SSH instead. And your system says, okay, I'll let you turn off Telnet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so people have found it very educational. There are organizations that use Bastille entirely for the educational component and don't actually have it hard in the system because they want to do it manually. Hopefully the assessment mode makes things easier for that. Okay, it's really easy to automate. You create a config. Two commands, you SCP a config over to another system and run Bastille over an SSH pipe and you can apply it to another system. If you're using one of those mass SSHers that lets you SSH to a thousand system to one, systems at once, congratulations, this gets really scalable. Okay, the whole thing is written so that it's very easy to script around Bastille. It's very easy to add on to it without having to know any Perl. Okay, the nice thing is, so why do you use Bastille or why do you use an automated system? Well. One of the reasons you do it is for consistency. If you don't have a thousand systems, fine. You like to do this, do this, do one the same way every time. Maybe you do it. You create a standard build config file. Maybe you make this part of your. Maybe you make this part of your build process. All you have to do is every time you basically you only have to update these config files when you get a new distro or when you get a new release of the distro. HPUX makes this really easy. There are four different ways. Part of their install process, they've ship, they're shipping with Bastille with the operating system. Um, what I want to do is let's see. We're running a little low on time. Uh, what I've got is a list of modules and kind of what they do. Um, would you guys rather see a list of modules and what they do, or would you rather kind of see how you add on to this? Add on. Okay, works for me. Skip, 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 skip. Bastille's actually really easy to add on to. We wrote it, and then like so many open source projects, six months later we rewrote it entirely. And the rewrite is just to make it was just to make it easier to maintain, and that happens on a lot of open source projects. It probably happens in a lot of commercial software because once you've written it once, you understand how to make it a lot better. So what we did is the whole thing's in Perl, but if you don't know Perl, we actually work to make it really understandable. And we actually work to make it really understandable so that you could so that you could work on this even if you don't know Perl. And I'll show you an example of how you kind of add a add something to turn off a set UID bit. Okay. So if you wanted to add an item, the first major thing you have to do is create a question for that item, basically that text. The explanation, here's why you should do this, here's why you shouldn't, what the question is, what the, an what the default answer could be. You can add modules, and we've had, we've had people contribute modules uh, before, and it's pretty easy. Um, here's, a, here's just the question type stuff. This first one is just every, every item gets its own name. 
There's a short explanation. You can have a long explanation so you can give the user more detail. There's a little explain less, explain more. So that lets them granularly decide, I know a lot about this kind of stuff, so tell me less. Um, there's a question. There's what distributions it works on. There's a default answer. There's a regular expression. Answers have to match. If you don't know what that means, don't, um, don't worry about it. You can skip that part. And there's some stuff that says what the next question is and what the previous question is. And you can actually skip that part if you want to. If I wanted to create a new thing that turned off set UID for, for dump and restore, this is the dump and restore action. I've got this if get global config, the module name, the question name, you could copy paste that, right? Equals yes. If they answered yes to this question, then I run B remove suid, remove set UID. It's, it's one line from dump. And this is a path name, but you can also, if, if that path differs from operating system to operating system, you can put in one of our get global things that says this is in a table somewhere. But you could just put user s bin dump. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so it's really easy. I'll show you the API. The API is really simple. Okay, it's you can go and you know be Chamad. Chamad changes the permissions. Chown changes the ownership. Chagroup removes set UID. Creates symlink. The reason we've end up a lot of these things are things that were present in Perl already. We wrappered them so that you can undo the whole thing. The idea behind Bastille is you can either granularly undo it, or we've got a big red button called revert. And that big red button yanks the system all the way back to where it was before you were running Bastille. It's not something you want to run six months later, because that part's hard. But if you just ran Bastille and you're like, wait, I answered yes to everything and I should have read revert, you hit your big red button and you start over. Or you hit your big red button and you throw away Bastille and curse my name. Right? Doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. So. These are other things. B check config off turns things off in the RC scripts and all that. You can copy files. These are kind of the fun ones. B append line just sticks a line on the end of a file if it's not already there. This is all made so that if you run Bastille, you can run it 8,000 times again with the same config file and not break the system. Because Bastille will look for the stuff that it's trying to add. You can insert lines, uh, you can insert lines before a given line in the file. You can prepend a line, put it at the beginning of the file. You can replace a given line. These are all basically this, this matches the way Unix the way the Unix config files are done. B hash comment line. What could be easier? You want to comment on, you want to turn a line off? You don't have to delete it. Just comment it out with hash. Com hash comment it out. Delete line is another thing you can do. And all of these work. They go and they all work on pro regular expressions. If you don't know that, you can kind of use exact matches. But this is all really simple to do. And that's the idea. That's the that's the API for for adding things, for adding new items. It's really actually quite easy. If you don't know Perl, you still have a pretty good chance of being able to add an item, especially if you can copy and paste something similar. I added something yesterday to remove, I added something yesterday in about five minutes to remove MDNS responder, that, that rendezvous, zero conf, bonjour thing that's on Apple. It's also on Red Hat Fedora Core now. It was really easy to turn it off. I copy and pasted something that turned off GPM because that used check config. And to turn off MDNS responder, it's another check config. It was really, really quick. Eight lines of Perl. And like, you know, these kind of lines, not the kind of lines you can't read. Right? Does that make sense? Um, doing the same thing, you create an audit item for it. You can, you can create an audit item. We want you to create an audit item for anything that you create a hardening item for. And all it is is you have this thing, just like this global test, the module name, and then that, that, name, of the, that name of the question equals sub. And you basically have a subroutine that does whatever it was that should be tested. And you return ask or, uh, ask or skip. So if, or you return one or zero. This, is, this says if B is suid. If ping is set UID or ping six is set UID, then I say, OK, the, the test fails. It's really kind of that easy. And you can do the same thing with match lines. You can, everything that we basically could do to something now has a corresponding check. B is service off. We'll go and tell you if something that's INET D based or XNET D based or RC based is on or off. Return match line. Is there a line in this file that matches this pattern? If I was hash commenting or deleting a line, now I can check and see if it's present. So now I have an, an easy, quick way to write a check at the same time that I'm writing the fix. That makes it a lot easier to develop the tool. It also it makes it easier to write, so, to write things for your environment. And the whole idea is that all these things should be pretty self-explanatory. B is package installed. Tells you if, an ins tells you if something's installed. Is process running? The idea is that it should sound like English. The idea is that this should be really easy for you to look at a few and then make your own. And you can make your own. You can use it in your environment. People have written whole modules. I've actually got a module author in the front row. Um, Mike Grash, hello. Um, anyway, uh, he wrote the port scan attack detector, which is like port sentry, except 8,000 times better. Um, 
it's just, it just is. You can look into it, you'll agree. Um, there's, you know, these tests are really easy to write. Um, I'm gonna stop now because we're basically about a minute before, but I've got some things to give out. I've got books, I've got t-shirts. The goons are desperate for me to get rid of them because they don't want to take them all home because they've got, they've already, they've already taken their own stash and, right, they've, they've got the extra ones. Um, I'm gonna be doing a book signing of the Snort 2.1 book, um, but here's another, this is another book that I worked on called Stealing the Continent, and here's the t-shirt. It's got a picture of the book, but it says, call it fiction if it helps you sleep better. Um, anyway, who wants a t-shirt? Oh, wow. Turn that check off for now, but we're turning it back on. We ran into a bug with how it worked on one distro versus another. That's a good question. What do you, intrusion prevention? Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question, over there. Oh, that's a good one. Can we check for SSH? Well, version one versus version two, better configuration than SSH. Not yet, but if you want to write it, or I want to write it, we'll do it. Uh, that's a bug. Yep, yep, yep. That one. Uh, can you test uh, SE Linux if it is in a targeted device permissive mode? Wow, can we check SE Linux to find if it's targeted or permissive mode? No. <laughs> I'd love to talk about it. If you are exiting the room, please exit this way.